Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> May I add my thanks <clears throat> excuse me, to the organizers for spending, what, over two years in uh, making it possible for us to meet uh, in Singapore and to exchange views. Um, <clears throat> I'm a stickler for terminology. And last evening, Professor Sassen dwelt extensively on globalization. Earlier today, Laurent talked about the possibility room, which leaves me only the return of geography. And if I may just make a comment, as a student of international politics, geopolitics, um, I would argue that that is a misplaced terminology. Because for us, geopolitics and geography have never left. Uh, we take it as a basic, fundamental element in all of our analyses. And we haven't been distracted by all of the school of thought which argues that distance, geography, space have been removed. Um, to my topic itself, <clears throat> from a geopolitical perspective, Global governance faces either of two alternative futures. At one extreme, our predictions assuring us of a great convergence of mankind, whereas the other extreme cautions us of a G0, leaderless planet Earth. That our present international system could go either way owes, in my opinion, to the unprecedented economic and technological globalization shaping our world in one direction, at the same time that a major reshuffling and redistribution of geopolitical power worldwide is taking us in the opposite direction. How to reconcile these two competing forces, one unifying, the other divisive, and how to avoid in political terms, the equally undesirable poles or extremes of hegemony, a unipolar world, or anarchy, centralized power and authority, as opposed to the diffusion of power and authority across the globe and throughout the international system. My paper, and I only deal with the essence of the paper, speaks to the balance of power approach toward global governance. Its main thesis is that decentralized, regionalized, post-Cold War balances of power, plural, such as those surfacing in Central Asia, the Middle East, the Far East, and elsewhere, are the direct outcome of these two conflicting macro trends towards centralization and unification versus diversity and the diffusion of power. And that whatever its faults, the theory of the balance of power does offer us reasonable prospects in between the two extremes of unipolar world and anarchy for a stable, workable, multipolar economic and political international system. Again, I want to be clear, not exactly your ideal, peaceful, or serene, one-world model of global society, but reasonable prospects for a stable, workable, multipolar economic and political international system. In defending this position, the key emphasis is on balancing the verb balancing rather than the noun, balance. I'm interested in the act of balancing rather than the actual condition of balance. And let me try to illustrate this. The simple traditional image of the balance of power is the delicately balanced scales. 50-50 between two centers of power, two great powers, A versus B, Britain versus France, you can choose Athens and Sparta. And this suggests, what does it 
symbolize for us? It symbolizes the idea of it being static, stable. To use the term stasis, N movement in and of itself can only dis cause a disequilibrium, upsetting the order and the stability. This is the traditional model. What I would like to suggest in its place Ah, no, sorry. <laughs> the alternative essence of the balance of power. And as if you're familiar with the sculpture known as a mobile, Alexander Calder in particular crafted many of these mobiles. Uh, the picture may be blurred, but I hope you, you sense the difference between the simple balance. Here, it is composed of a number of parts, elements, they may be of different size, different states, small and large, powerful and weak, different actors. What is critical here is that they are connected, interconnected in our era, and that this mobile is so constructed that it permits, indeed it encourages change. Winds can blow, and uh, in the end, this will absorb the, the change and return to a degree of stability. I think there is a lot to be learned from simply changing our image of what the balance of power is. What we should be doing is not looking mathematically or qualitative geography, whether indeed there is a 50-50 or 49-49, 51, 45, 55, distribution of power. That is not the way to go, if only because we can never really verify whether between the Soviet Union and the United States there was an exact symmetry of power. What we should be interested in is the movement, the balancing of power. How does power adjust, absorb change? And therefore, let me suggest uh, and emphasize, if I may, that the balance of power approach towards global governance is the best, perhaps, that we can strive for in this real world. It is, has its limitations. It doesn't provide us with, again, the ideal e Immanuel Kant, Kantian version of perpetual peace, but it enables us a degree of order, stability, and therefore, within this stability, to be able to progress in the direction of globalization. Now, in order to do this, the balance of power since the end of the Second World War, has, as a theory, has fallen into disfavor. Very few have appreciated it, have argued that the old balance of power that we know throughout history has become obsolete. It no longer is applicable in today's world. First, because there was the superpower equivalence, and so there was very little room for mobility under, in the Cold War. And in the, uh, with the end of the Cold War, 1987 and beyond, it's been a unipolar American moment, America's moment. And so that doesn't fit the traditional model. I am arguing that the balance of power theory is with us and will remain with us in the future. And globalization will take place and may indeed be facilitated through the proper understanding of the dynamics of the balancing of power. But in order to do this, in order to reappreciate the utility and the relevance of the balance of power concept, we need to make several adjustments. And this is the essence of my paper, and with your permission, I'll take the time that I have to spell out six adjustments that need to be made in order for us to really make this into a workable, useful instrument of understanding contemporary international relations. The first, there needs to be a shift from, and I believe, ah, 
Here, once I just graphically, if you will, the contrast between the two views of the balance of power. One, immobilism. The other, allowing and indeed encouraging change. From, here is the first adjustment. From balance to balancing. The balance of power is usually interpreted as a, an observable situation. We can look out at the world and say, is there or is there not a balance of power? Or it is usually defined as a measurable distribution of power, known as the geometry of power. Once again, 50-50, 49-51. Laurent spoke about the qualitative geography, and I subscribe to that rather than the preoccupation with number crunching and data, because in the end, we cannot really know objectively whether there is an exact parity or not. So to move rather to the, the, the physics of power, and therefore the emphasis on the verb, balancing is action-oriented. It requires doing policy-making decisions. Balancing is dynamic, fluid, ongoing, unending. In short, it is a process. It is an unending process. And thirdly, balancing suggests a recalibration. You can move and power shifts from one center to another. So from balance to balancing. Secondly, I want to reemphasize this point, we need to move from measuring balance to balancing mechanics. Instead of trying to quantify balance of power equations, as I've just illustrated, what we should be looking at is how, not the what, but the how. How do ongoing balancing processes actually function? And even more important, how might they be regulated more effectively? And there are, in the paper I spell out, there are so many mechanisms available to the statesman, to the diplomat, even to the businessman. Alliance building, armament, rearmament. We looked at the cost, I believe, yesterday or this morning, the F-35. The arms, arms racing, joining in pacts, regional pacts, ASEAN and others, joining international organizations, are ways of moving up or down, increasing or decreasing power. A third important change requirement is that traditionally balance of power has been studied at the global or systemic superpower or world balances. Is this an era of the balance of power worldwide? Instead, I would encourage the idea of multiple centers of power. And therefore, balancing should be looked at at the subsystem level in regional, subcontinental, and local contests. North and South Korea, Iran, Turkey, Russia, in the Caucasus, India, Pakistan. Um, the most fascinating contemporary illustration is the United States, pivot to Asia, but then just in this morning's paper, there are indications that the Chinese leadership is looking to cultivate Russia as a, to offset, to counter the United States initiative at increasing its influence and power. So we should be looking at lower level contests, decentralized balancing of power, and these resultant subbalances reconfirm the theory that the balance of power is very much relevant. It's taking place all around us. And nowhere, I would argue, more so than in the Asia-Pacific region. The next adjustment. We always limited balance of power to the great powers. Once again, England and France in the 19th century. Was there a balance of power or not between them? Germany and England on the eve of World War I. It seems to me that is a narrow preoccupation with rivalries involving two or more great powers or two superpowers, as though balancing of power is a privilege exclusive to great powers. Not at all. It is readily engaged in by all actors, large and small, states and non-states. 
And then the next to the last of the six adjustments, from top down to bottom up balancing. Usually, we look at the Russia, the Soviet Union, and the United States formed a Cold War balance of power, and uh, that basically paralyzed and determined the positions of all other actors, as though dictated from above. Imposed is the term I use, from above. Instead, if you look at it a little differently, these local balances of power, localized, sort of percolate upward. And if there is an equilibrium between North and South Korea, for purposes of illustration, as well as in other sub-regions, then the net total effect in the aggregate will be something approximating a balance of power worldwide. And then lastly, the sixth and final adjustment. Classical balance of power theory, students of the balance of power, had a very narrow conception until quite recently of the balance as being a function solely of interactions among states, borders, arms races, military alliances, diplomatic relations, interstate is what determined a balance, A versus B. Instead, in the 21st century, and looking ahead, what we our overall prospects for equilibrium, if you're going to study the balancing of power, you'll need to look not only at interstate relations, but developments, social, economic, political, ideological, within the individual state, competing states, such as degree of social co cohesion, economic market forces, political institutions and their stability, regime change, caliber of leadership, transitions of power. Any one of those will affect that country's relative position vis-a-vis -vis others. And indeed, what takes place within states may actually be a determining factor in balancing outcomes. So if you're interested in pursuing it further, to, to see the actual, how I developed this thesis in the paper, my bottom line, in order to keep within the time frame, is I would argue that the balance of power theory, if reinterpreted to mean focusing on balancing of power, remains very much with us in today's and tomorrow's world, is a useful organizing device and concept to be able to make rhyme or reason, to make sense of a lot of developments taking place within the world. The United States is contributing to a rebalancing of power by domestic changes within American society and attitudes towards foreign policy just as the actions of smaller countries, numerous countries, who have defied the United States, Turkey, just off the top of my head, Turkey, Israel, the Palestinian Authority, um, North Korea, on and on, countries that doesn't square with our notion of a unipolar American hegemony. Countries acting independently for their own interests and who are behaving according to the dictates of the balancing of power mechanism view of, of the theory. And so on, I would argue that looking at the, unlike some of the papers presented when this is a sense of balance, who looked at micro world issues. What I'm suggesting here is a macro world interpretation or frame for understanding so much of what is taking place in the world. And it's a decentralized, changing, fluid balancing of power. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Very kind of enlightening uh, speech. But I'm thinking about some kind of practical cases. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about Myanmar, which is now newly opening to the world. Apparently, what plagued Myanmar is the ethnic issues. It has so many ethnic groups. So how do you view, I mean, putting your theory or your proposal about uh, this six adjustment to a country like Myanmar, um, can you elaborate more that if you want to talk about balance of power or how it's going to interact with the outer world, 
What about the ethnic issues? Because it seems that it's not just like a bottom up or top down and not just like systemic or regional. It is so complicated. And the other ones like Central Asia, as you just mentioned, besides ethnic issue, there is resource, there is energy. So what about these two cases? If I may take the last one first. Resources, energy, these have always been part and parcel of the competition for influence and power and leverage. So there's nothing new in that. And the, this is the return or the revenge of geography, if you will. The competition. And we heard last evening about uh, China investing heavily in, in Africa, crossing continents, regional boundaries. This is, this is perfectly consistent with the balance of power. Um, what your first question addresses indeed what I tried to emphasize, the sixth and final one, and that is classical balance of power students only looked at the relations between countries. Alliances, non-alliances, uh, uh, um, friendship or hostility, relations or break off of relations. If you really want to understand how this uh, mobile works and absorbs change, you must be sensitive to developments taking place within society, including the, the ethnic one. Now, I apologize, I confess, I don't have any familiarity uh, with Myanmar because it has been sort of isolated or isolated itself. Uh, but the more we learn, I'm sure that the more it, it is, opens itself to external relations. It removes itself from this period of isolation. Uh, it will be, and it overcomes ethnic diversity and achieves a degree of social cohesion and consensus. I have to believe that Myanmar will increase its sphere of influence in its immediate neighborhood. And that's true. I'm with, from within the Middle East. It's, we look, we in Israel look very much with concern what's taking place in Egypt. Egypt was the dominant actor within Arab world politics. But when you have social tensions and a breakdown of order and rivalries, or Syria, another neighboring country, we look out at our region and see that these countries, ipso facto, must lose a degree of regional and external influence. It's like they have to put their own house in order. It's time out from the competition and, and, and balancing of power. And so who is the beneficiary? For example, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, because they have a reasonable degree of social stability, economic growth, and that enhances their position. So the mobile is constantly shifting. You have to keep your eye, not on the ball, you have to keep your eye on all the component parts, which makes balancing the power perspective so fascinating. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your paper and your talk. And I thought that it was such a great idea to move, um, well, to get rid of that metaphor, which is so much based in Newtonian <coughs> physics of scales, and to move to a much more sophisticated machinery of balance. And indeed, why should we use very simplistic machines to symbolize very complex relationships? We live That's, in a world of complexity, yeah, so exactly. we have to... <laughs> so I thought that was fantastically to the point. I can't help but to ask a question about the role of nuclear weapons in uh, the new multipolar balance of power. Your point is well taken. And let me see if I can not incorporate it into. In the Cold War era, the, the view was frozen. And that is, there are two superpowers, more or less equally balanced. What distinguishes them from all other countries? is the fact that they, are, they have possession of nuclear capability. And that puts them in the special category we had to create it. Not just great powers, but superpowers. Um, but, to use the term, we have, come, we have learned how to live with the bomb. And that is what we have found. And because now the number of countries with nuclear capabilities has proliferated. And, the more, for whatever reasons, moral, rational, economic, 
that they are reluctant to use their nuclear advantage for fear of mad, mutual assured destruction, the more they redirect, rechannel their energies into the conventional mechanisms of balancing of power, uh, economic trade relations, diplomatic relations, conventional arms building, navies, China, Navy construction, um, and um, a number of other mechanisms. One of them, which ought to be how you want to increase your status and your stature internationally, what you should be concentrating on is your domestic, internal elements of soft power, to use a term that was used this morning. Um, and so there are, there's a whole school of thought that says, you know, let more and more countries have nuclear capabilities. It's, it's analogous to um, weightlifting, muscle building. What the mo stronger you are in that capability, there's usually a trade-off. And that is you become cumbersome, slower, less agile in your movement. Unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. But, but you see, and, and therefore, they won't use those nuclear weapons. It's prestige. It gives them a, perhaps a false sense of security. But they build up this wall of nuclear invincibility. And nevertheless, international politics always finds side entrances to re-divert the energies into more conventional means of balancing power that we find throughout certainly modern history. I, I have a comment and question. Um, I also very much like the, the, the movement from uh, balance to balancing and the movement from the scales to the mobile. I think it's Thank a great uh, image. Uh, and, and it fits very well with actually quite a number of things we've been discussing, I, f I find. And in particular, for example, if I go back to Jan and Matthias' paper in the morning, a lot of actually what you were saying is applicable to their, so to their you know, questioning about how do you regulate modern finance. You, know, you need polycentricity. Uh, you need this constant action because it's never stable. You constantly have to modify, in a sense, the, the, the balance to be sure that the balancing is stable throughout, etc. So there are a lot of similarities, a lot of similarities in all the work we've done on transnational governance in general. The one thing maybe that I would add to, to your last point where you say we, had to, we have to go beyond the interaction between states to, to, to look at what is happening inside state and how this disrupts, which is completely true. I would still add also that we also probably have to put in the picture many other actors, some of which we talked about this morning, the think tanks, uh, the, pr the multinational firms, NGOs, NGOs international organizations, non-states. Which are definitely playing a big part. But uh, I think my, my question, the, so this is really more common, the question really is more about if we go back to the image of the, mobi the mobile, uh, I mean, there are two ways to look at it. Either the mobile is completely, uh, in a sense, um, uh, pure chance. I mean, the movements are pure chance, okay? So there's no, no kind of, uh, in a sense, framing of the movements of the mobile. Uh, or there is framing, which takes, would take in our world the form of soft power, and would take in our, our world the forms of, of, of basic rules of the game in the background, which have you know, many different forms. And the question is obviously here, who is, the, who is Calder? Eh? Calder versus somebody else. And, and what is, the, what is the, the, the rules of the balancing that are uh, being, being put on, on that mobile? Um, and, and who has the possibility to set those rules? And, and so, so it's, you know. Push it all, de push it all depends upon your ideology <laughs> or theology. I suppose one hand, it's like a multiple choice. One would say, who is sort of the regulator? Yeah, the regulator and, and regulation. Okay, one, sense, yeah. one, if one wishes, one would say it's in the hands of God. It's the Almighty. Okay. No, yeah, the I'm other not, is, I'm not going <laughs> if you're Adam Smith, you would argue that it's the invisible hand. Yeah. Somehow things work out. And it's true. We're impatient. We want to see the rebalancing of power taking place in front of our eyes uh, very quickly. Uh, but it doesn't happen. The recalibration of power from the United States, which was thought to be so dominant, and then all of a sudden we see now that the United States has to adjust to sharing 
power with a number of other authorities and centers, states and non-states, international organizations. It takes time, frustratingly slow. But if you're a believer in the balancing of power theory, it will take place. Just be patient. It just, it, it's independent decisions taken by countless actors, first at a regional local basis, and then, like these colors are meant to indicate, the reds sort of achieve a balance in South uh, China Seas or, um, or in the Korean Peninsula or the Indian subcontinent. Um, and then these add up to a larger, basically stable international order. Perhaps that's the most that we can strive or achieve, at least under present conditions. Um, then there are those who would say, yes, this is still too anarchic. It leaves too much to chance, randomness. What, what we really need are to, alternatively, uh, clarify and establish clearer rules of conduct and behavior, international law. Another would be international organization. The more empowered the UN is, the less it will leave it to chance or to local actors irresponsibly upsetting the delicate balance. So it's again a matter of one's perspective or what emphasis uh, you give in international politics. But surely there are a number of, of choices. And uh, logically, one would not wish the best option is not simply leaving it to chance. Thank you very much again.